uh, consulted with retinal surgeon, Bristol, UK, and uh, Dr. Grant Borchetti, um, glaucoma specialist and anti signal surgeon specialist from Arkansas, US, and uh, Dr. Eman Chandra, uh, with retinal surgeon uh, from uh, South End, uh, UK. So, Bristol, UK, and uh, Dr. Grant Borchetti. Um, glaucoma specialist and anti signal surgeon specialist from Arkansas, US, and so the uh, retinal Dr. surgeon Man Chandra, from a specialist and anti signal surgeon. This is coming from Facebook, so I think if we have Facebook off uh, on, we need to put the sound down. This echo is coming from Facebook. All right, we'll uh, start our presentation today with. Dr. Uh, this is the contents we'll be going through small pupils, floppy iris, and then we'll go iris repair and see about your repair. And then we'll go into a very important topic, iris prosthesis and artificial iris. Then uh, more on iris prolapse, retropulsion, and iris supported lens. We're starting with small pupils. Abdullah. Hello, good, good afternoon, everyone. So let's start with a light topic. It's about small pupil. Actually, uh, I often ask myself, what is a small size pupil? Could be five millimeter, six millimeter, or four millimeter. In fact, there's no actual uh, magic number. It's usually related to other factors like uh, intraoperative situation, uh, technical difficulty of the case, and also biomechanical propriety of the iris. And like any small bubble, we usually start management pharmacological, and then we try to use our viscoelastic devices. And if they don't work, we resort back to mechanical relation like the hooks or the rings. And so aiming for a little bit larger bubble to allow us to do a good sized capsulorexis. So let's start with the hooks. There are different ways of putting the hooks. You can put four hooks in a square or a diamond, or you can even put five hooks in a pentagon-like shape. Yes, and we'll show a couple of videos actually about each way. So in this case, there is a small bubble. I plan to put four hooks. Often try to orient uh, the hooks the way your FACO works. So we usually put our FACOs like in an axis, like uh, 11 o'clock. So I often try to put the hooks in that orientation. And when I plan, I can use either an MVR blade or even uh, a needle, a 27 or 28 gauge needle to make the hooks. Uh, the good tip here is that when you do the uh, incision, just try to go a little bit posterior, which is slightly different when, we, when you do the parasynthesis. And in many situations, I try to put the hooks initially first, and I found this step very useful, just to inject a little bit of viscoelastic under the edge of the pupil. And then this makes it easier to engage the hooks. And I often try to engage them one by one. And initially, moderate tension, but later on, I try to do uh, adjust the tension. And you can see the most uh, important thing is to allow me to good uh, sized capsulorectus, at least 5.5 millimeter. And yeah, let's go for the next, please. Oh, next one, please. Sorry. Uh, this is another example. I'll just show you the variation of the technique. Here I decided to put five hoops and I use the needle uh, instead of using the MVR. The MVR is definitely sharper, but makes a little bit larger incision. So here I decided to put another fifth hook. The main advantage of the fifth hoops is that it clears more space around six o'clock position. So this allows you, if you do chopping, it makes often easier if you plan to go underneath the capsule. And also what I found that when I put five hoops, I tend to put less stretch on the uh, iris, so less likely to induce any iris damage. And with that, you can put the stain either be, oh, I, I think the, uh, I'm sorry, it's playing up. Uh, yeah. And I think, yeah, you good size the capsulorexis, and then you do the FACO as uh, you do. 
Oh, I, I think the video is going. Uh, should I go back? From... Sorry, it's. I think there's some technical issue with the video. Yeah. Is... <clears throat> Sorry, Abdullah, is there any bit you want to show back? or? No, no, it's fine. It's not fine. I, I think it's repeating itself. Okay, right, it's looping. Right. It should present from my computer then. It's okay. I mean, it's. Uh, okay. okay, yes. We'll see how. Right. Well, thank you so much. So, uh, Grant, do you do anything different putting the hooks? Do you do them more posteriorly or do you do one under the wound? When I do iris hooks, <clears throat> I. I um, do I agree with the tip to put them more posteriorly? I, I don't typically uh, use one sub incisionally unless I have, um, you know, if you make your phaco incision a little more anterior, uh, you, usually the iris is uh, is well enough posterior. But if it's coming up into the phaco tip, then I find it helpful to pull it posteriorly. But I usually use the rings rather than the hooks for most uh, small pupil cases. Yeah. Right. Amen, do you do anything different? No, but I'd I, I like. If you're going to need um, capsule dyes, um, in the case of if the, if, the, if the lens is very white, and you put viscoelastic in to help you put the hooks in or the ring in, I recommend taking the viscoelastic then out once your hooks are in place before putting any capsule dye in. Because if you've got HPMC or, or, or Helon in the eye, and then you put vision blue in or capsule blue, um, you won't stain the capsule. So then put your FACO probe in, take the OVD out, and then stain the capsule after you've got the hooks in. It's just a little bit, but I, I think so. Um, you know, you've got the hooks in, you're relieved, you want to move on to the next stage, you just <laughs> put in, but then you get no staining because you've got OVD in the eye. And Richard, do you do anything else? Anything different? Uh, I've, I've got no other major tips apart from um, the hooks I find are often too um, curved back on themselves. So I often stretch them a little bit to give a, a wider, little hook to pull back but you know that's that's just makes it easier to get them in yeah for me i go more posteriorly so always i go like conjuring tyrants clear and more posteriorly and go with the iris plane i find that easier to get the iris and i do a diamond with one incision with one under the main incision through a separate wound well going posteriorly also um gives you a little spot of blood Yes. To identify the hole. Yes. Uh, particularly if you're going to use a needle, they're very small holes. Yeah. Uh, and true. if you go it, you'll get a little spot of heme or it'll direct you to where, you, where you've made the hole in to put your hooks in. So, Abdullah, the picture here with lots of uh, rings. Which one do you like the most? Actually, I have experience with the Malugin and the Oasis one, but uh, I prefer the Malugin one. It's very good ring actually it's a game changer in pupil dilation and once the, these rings are in the market our uh, we tend to use hooks less and less than what we used to do right so, so i got your video here of uh, malusian ring so the malusian ring actually is a very clever device and in this case as you can see the pupil is not that small actually it's possibly six millimeter when, when i started after putting the viscoelastic but as you know, this patient was under topical anesthesia. He's also in warfarin, and he is uh, a little bit squeezer. So I made the decision quickly to put the ring. And when I put the ring, I tried to first try to engage at least two or three of the scrolls on the insertion. Uh, can you read the video, please? Yes, sorry. Yeah, see, yeah, so yeah, I tried to at least engage two. If I'm lucky, I may be able to engage three uh, while inserting the rings. And here you can see I'll tweak it a little bit to try to engage the one on the uh, other side. And then with another second instrument, i try to engage the remaining four scrolls. The main advantage of this ring compared to the hoops is that the induced pupil dilation with pressure on eight points, and they are less traumatic compared to the hoops. And actually, also, you can get them in two sizes, 6.25 and 7 millimeter. And what we try to do when we aim for pubic dilatation is try to make a good-sized capsular rexis. This is mainly to avoid what I often call the curse of the small rexis. 
And I often try to go with the capsular axis as much as I can along the edge of the pupil. I often intend to make it larger than what I uh, intend to do. Removal of the rings is quite simple and straightforward. You just need to engage two of them. And once you disengage from the pupil two of the rings, you can bring it out with the device. Either you can grab it from the scroll or you can just grab it uh, from each bar tip, actually. My tip here is to try to take it off while uh, you are in the EC. So withdraw it slowly while you are in the anterior chamber. And yeah, here I'll do the device. You may also put some viscoelastic above or under it. And then I grab the device and try to grip, grab it from, actually any bark will work, not necessarily the scroll, and grab it while in the anterior chamber. It comes nicely and you can see the bubble is very nice for the rest of the surgery. Yeah? Right. Thank you so much, Abdullah. That's uh, very nice. So uh, I'll show, uh, yeah, so this is a uveitic uh, patient here with uveitic membrane, and these can be challenging for small pupils. So the important thing is to find the correct um, entrance to the pupil because sometimes it's a very small area and then after that you hold the membrane and peel through it. Uh, you just need to be a, a touch gentle, which maybe I'm not the case here because you can too much pull on the iris, you can cause an iris dialysis. And that's here you can see the membrane and taking it off. So just try to find the, the point where the membrane is and uh, capsurexus forceps is very helpful for this. Uh, this, is a, um, this is another case here where I'll put a um, malusion ring. And just proceed Saniki, which you can disrupt with the viscoelastic. Like here, and here comes the malusion ring. And I've got several tips here. The first is don't don't push the malusion ring like this. Actually, get the inserter under the iris, and then your first one is definitely going to be in. And then I try to wiggle it to uh, get the two sides one in at the same time. And if it's not working, I will actually pull it back and try to get it. Now the two are in then I would use a, si a second instrument from the side port. And that works so well. Now you uh, should be in business soon, and then you get this in. Do you worry uh, a little bit about the slight stretch on the iris? Is this, um... I do. I think if you don't pull it, nothing happens. The problem is if you pull it, but I think if you push, usually nothing happens. And then I remove it in a different way. I just take this one off, and that's it. And then I, tr I try to go not on the ring directly, but I go on the side, and then I move to the ring. I find that easier to go on the side and move to the ring. And I try to get from the ring because it curls back in more regularly so it doesn't really hit the iris or the angle. And that's it. Then just need to tease it slowly because you're pulling on the iris here. Just tease it a bit slowly out. And then you're out of the eye. It just curls more regularly if you take it from the ring. Uh, Ahmed, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, yeah. Do you have any circumstances you'd prefer to use hooks? Because, uh, you know, people suggest, and it is probably true, that the rings are uh, less traumatic for the pupil margin. When would you use hooks nowadays, then? I use hooks in very, very small pupil, where it's very difficult to get an illusion ring. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so you have text when you've got very small patterns. Yeah, very, very small, but I still tend to use more rings. Yeah. And I'm removing this, and I think this is really maybe not necessary. Maybe I just could have tidied that up with scissor because actually these membranes are connecting to the iris epithelium behind the iris. So I think maybe just initially I could have just cut this off with a scissor rather than peel it off. 
And to be honest, the more like here, I would just I could have just cut this with a scissor and that's it. The more you do in UV cases, it comes and bites you back. And I think that's the problem with UV cases. But. Yeah. I think uh, there's also a couple of indications for the hook so far. Sometimes you can use them in some selective cases or with the uh, iris prolapse. Even you can may use just a single hook. Mm. And also uh, cases with uh, iris retrobulsion, you can use a single hook just to stabilize the iris into their frag. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll go through that uh, shortly as well. All right, excellent. <laughs> There's a slightly off flavor uses, aren't they? They're, or, or, you know, they're using uh, the hooks for a slightly different indication rather than different midriasis. But yeah. I'll add, I'll add to that too as well. If you have a, a case with weak zonules, iris hooks are preferable because then you can use the hook to stabilize the capsule as well. Yes. And then also, if you're doing IOL work in a small pupil, um, you know, not cataract surgery, but your eye, uh, lens repositioning or suturing, um, I prefer hooks instead of rings in those cases as well. Yeah, we have a very good comment here from Dr. Ralwan. Uh, so he's saying hooks in small pupils and in shallow AC. Yeah, we totally concur. Shallow yeah. AC can be sometimes difficult. That's what I was going to ask, was going to ask Ron, the narrow angles and the very shallow AC. I, I prefer using hooks in those circles. Yeah, I think we all use 6.25 Maluga and we don't use the 7. <laughs> seven big, right? Does anyone use the 7? No. No. They no. are very large and they are also very difficult to insert. You need more stretch on the pupillary margin to put them. Yeah. And sometimes actually malusion ring does not work well with floppy iris and we'll show a bit on that. Mm. So Abdullah? Yeah, again, this is a new condition recently described in 2005 and we are getting familiar with it with the heavy use of tamsilocin. There are also other drugs that can cause the floppy iris like the doxazosin and other drugs. These drugs usually affect the smooth muscles of the bladder, but they inadvertently relax the iris uh, dilatal muscles. And as the term implies, we end up with very floppy iris. Uh, next, please. So it's often characterized by the tread, the, the iris billowing, and the tendency of the iris to relax and the people gets smaller as the surgery goes on. So you may start the surgery with seven millimeter pupil and in the middle, you end up with five or even four millimeter. And as we all know, there's loads of complication because of that. Again, the strategy is the same. We use our midriatic and then we use the viscoelastics and if they don't work, we can use the hooks or the ring. Uh, so in this case, uh, this patient has a floppy iris and I decided just to do it uh, without any mechanical dilation. So I just put the viscoelastic as usual. During the stage, you will try to do small incision as much as possible. And when you do the capsular excess, try to make it as bigger as you can, preferably along the edge of the pupil. So you may end up with 5.5 or 6 millimeter capsular excess and try to make the wounds well constructed to avoid any leak during the surgery. And as long as you get a good size capsular axis, most of the rest of the surgery often goes straight forward. And I'll show you this in this interesting case, what happened when I was trying to insert the IOL. So I have now about 2.2 main incision, which we usually use to inject our uh, IOL. And meanwhile, I'm trying to put the lens. The iris, the floppy iris, starts to come through the incision. If you can notice, so I stopped and then further uh, try to burb the iris a little bit with the wound and injected some viscoelastic. That's it. And further, further pushing of the iris backwards. You can see the iris is very floppy in, in that situation. And I tried once more, but the eye is still prolapsing, and you can see it came out again. Sometimes in that selective, uh, uh, in that situation, you have a couple of options. One option is to put a iris hook, one single iris hook to stabilize the pupil, or you can push a little bit back and put a blood of viscoelastic 
what I call a blood, I bit like a cohesive viscoelastic from the one of the side boards, just trying to push uh, the iris a little bit further at that side, in combination with increasing the size of the wound. I believe Aman Chandra will, will explain that in details later on, but unless you increase the size of the wound, it's unlikely to work. See, in that situation, the lens came nicely and I was able to inject it. I think the main message here is try not to ignore this uh, subtle prolapse, because if you ignore it, you may induce some iris damage and you make it uh, uh, make it even further complicated. Thank you, Allah. Very interesting. So, uh, oh, are you going back? Richard, would you do something different at this stage? So here, you have the situation is here. The iris is coming. The eye is filled with viscoelastic. What would you do differently here? Or would you do the same, Richard? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I think I'd probably do the same. I. I you know, when it keeps on coming out like that, sometimes if that's a superior location, you could do a little uh, localized PI there and that might help it. But um, apart from that, I think I would just do the same as you've done and put a big plug of viscoelastic and you know, try and get the iris as far back as possible. Yeah. I think Aman is going to show more on that. And as Abdullah was doing, mean, making the eye more soft uh, helps as well. One tip I find helpful is actually when you insert the lens uh, to insert it the other way, to insert the, the injector the other way. So instead of putting the injector this way, is to put it actually the other way. It drops less and then you change the direction. That sometimes helps as well. Grant, will you yep. different? I, I actually do that every time I put a lens in. Actually, I always have it in upside down like that and then rotate it. And I, I just find it easier to get it in that way around um, and then rotate it. That, really, that can be helpful. So Dalla, you use midriatics if six millimeter or more and after other than that you use hooks or rings? Actually some people say six millimeter is a flag or a red flag but uh, in my experience sometimes you may start with a seven or even larger pupil and it gets smaller as the surgery goes on. And some people correlated that with the long-term uh, use of uh, alpha blockers. But again, cases behave differently. And I'm a little bit extra cautious when I deal with these cases. And I have a low threshold to use mechanical dilation, either hooks or uh, wings. Right. So, okay, I mean, on the same subject, floppy iris. So this is a case actually with less than six millimeters started here. So about 50% of patients on Tamsulosin would have uh, floppy iris syndrome. So there's a question about what local anesthesia you would use. I think topical is fine, but if you think the case is going to be uh, difficult, then a subtenon as suggested here by Dr. Mohammed Saad Rashad from the UK might be a good option, especially if you think that the case is going to go longer. Uh, we have a question as well about the wound. Would a uniplanar or multiplanar incision help in cases of small pupil or floppy iris? Grant, do you think that helps like having a, I mean, we all agree about the wound construction, but do you think a uniplanar versus a multiplanar incision would help? I, I think that uh, the multiplanar versus uniplanar is mostly helpful for, for wound closure at the end of the case. I, I think um, the, the length of the incision and the location is probably a little more important. Um, of course, you don't want to um, be too anterior, but uh, just starting your incision slightly more anterior, especially if you're doing it from a temporal approach, is helpful. Um, in these cases because it gets it a little bit farther away from the iris and also maybe just make sure it's not too short. Um, sometimes we can get away with shorter incisions and in routine phacos, but not in IFIS uh, uh, cases. So yeah, John Chancellor has yes, peripheral incision and uh, not too short, but still not too long. It makes things difficult. So this is, uh, patient is on Flomax. If you're on Flomax, you have a 50% chance, a rough figure to have IFIS. So remember that uh, figure. And here, we started the case, and we're managing well. The pupil is not too small managing, but then you can see here the problem is the iris becomes floppy. 
as you work and the pupil is getting smaller. Uh, so, let me just speed this a bit for the sake of time. So, so I stopped and you can see here the floppy iris as I come out and now injecting intracameral phenylephrine, diluted intracameral phenylephrine. So the way we do it is 0.25 minim, uh, which are available in the UK, not in the US, and I dilute it eight times. You can dilute it less. Some people use it as it is, but I tend to dilute it. And you can see here, the pupil is actually rounding up nicely and dilating. And more importantly, is that as we go in, then the uh, strength of the iris and the tone of the iris is regained which really works so well. So if that is available, I prepare it in every IFAS case and use it at the very early start of the, uh, of the case. Uh, intracameral adrenaline works okay as well, but not as good. This is a very ca bad case of floppy iris, and you can see from the word go, the iris is in my face. So I'm trying here to do it, and again, if it's too much prolapse, I've put an illusion ring, but as you can see here, it's actually useless. The iris just cannot hold it. So I went back and took that out, but it just it's, it's really useless. It's just moving and the iris cannot hold it. And that's where iris hooks actually can be better. So I took this out. And you see when you take it out, not from the ring, it just keeps rotating and can be like difficult. So I managed by hook or by crook to uh, finish that. And you will see here when we come to coming out of the eye, I'm trying to be really careful coming out of the eye to keep plying the wound with the faker, but again, iris prolapse. Now, this is a good tip, which I saw, I think Howard Fine first introduced that, is the irrigation is coming from the coaxial IA and I'm using the aspiration by manual. The way it works, it plugs the iris. So it's even better than using by manual. So that's like a combo, and it works well to keep plugging the iris and plugging the main wound. And switching hand, and then I managed to put a lens in, and very important to get the iris, put myotic in to collect the iris, and I would put a stitch in this case. And then lastly here is a technique that was introduced by Hamish Taller in the UK many years back, where actually to avoid a um, problem with hydrodissection in floppy iris, you hydrodissect from a separate the wound. Piece is inserted with the primary uh, I'm sorry. into the anterior chamber mm -hmm. as usual. The cannula okay. is passed under the edge of the capsular rexus opposite the side port with the surgeon's non-dominant hand. Hydrodissection is carried out, ensuring a complete wave and can be repeated if needed. Then, phago emulsification is started using the surgeon's usual technique. Sorry, that was a medical student uh, putting the technique together. That's a much more beautiful voice than yours. Yes, yes, much beautiful. <laughs> and you can do this by the non-dominant hand or you have another person teaching. And actually, this is, goes with the Bernoulli principle that Amanda is going to touch on. But uh, you're, pl you're plugging the main wound, and the iris is not going to protrude there because the tip of the iris is away from the iris root. So it's nice. It, you don't have increased pressure because the fluid goes in the phaco. Uh, but it's just slightly difficult to, to master initially. So uh, any, any comments about floppy iris from Richard? Um, I, um, I recently no. last night no. cases of patients on alpha blockers actually, and and, then, and I would put phenylephrine um, intracamerally at the beginning of the, every case. So any patient who's known to have an alpha blocker, and the iris has not been a problem in one of those cases. You know, I've got plenty of cases where iris has got involved, but I think if you put the phenylephrine, just put it in, regardless of how the eye might look. If you know they're an alpha blocker. The morbidity of putting in some phenylephrine into the eye, I think, is very low. Um, and it really adds an element of rigidity to the eye. And with regard to the phenylephrine, um, there's a nice paper that, by David Lockington that, that looked at the concentration of, of um, phenylephrine or, or other drugs put into the AC when you dilute it yourself. And it's very variable. Whereas if you put it in neat, you've got a much better chance of getting the concentration you might expect. Oh, so you put it neat? 
Yeah, so if you dilute it with seven drops or one drop, you get such a variable concentration into the anterior chamber. There's a really nice paper that was published a few years ago that demonstrates that. As you put it in meat, you're much more likely to get a concentration that you might expect. Right. So we have a, a comment by Rajesh on face, Facebook that I actually think is spot on uh, in these IFIS cases. Turn off your irrigation before you remove your uh, yep. your instrument from the main incision, and uh, most of the time you, you won't get prolapse. That's a very good point. One thing as well, if you're going to inject, especially if you're going to inject it, eat, put it better under the iris because the, the muscle is there and you're also getting away from the cornea, so maybe less toxicity, which I... Uh, used to do as well, put it under the iris. Uh, Richard, any questions? Any no, um, no, I've, I've, no, no extra comments on that. Um, I was, I was going to ask um, a concentration. So you use two point five percent phenylephrine minim, do you, yeah. Aman? Draw it up and put it in. And what volume of that do you inject? Well, I, I, I draw it up into a, into a, into a one mil syringe or a half mil syringe and just pop it. 0.1 or 0.2 mils in and see, see how it reacts. The beauty is you probably need much less volume and you know what you're getting in. Whereas when you dilute it yourself with a few drops here and there, you're getting some things water. Mm -hmm. You shake it up and you don't know. And for me, when you know what you know what the minimum's got in it, I, I'll put it in just neat. Mm. Yeah, that's not available in the US, so epi sugar yeah. king, but it's not as beautiful as the uh, phenylephrine, uh, the epi sugar king. Right, we'll, uh, sorry. Uh, now, uh, important topic, iris repair, a man. Ah, I see, yes. So um, I, I didn't invent this knot, this is the Seeps knot. This is a model that I've, um, that my colleague and friend Tom Butler created. And as you see, it's, it's a big model of an eye with a bit of gauze that's been ripped in half to represent the iris. It's, um, and it allows you to do things like this kind of maneuver on a bigger scale to look what's going on. So the Seeps knot's a great, sort of not to repair um, iris defects. And it's usually done with a proline suture. So this the coat hook that's, that's been fashioned represents the needle of a, of a proline. And at the top there, you've got a, a paracentesis, and at the bottom, you've got a paracentesis. So you pass this proline through the iris, and, start, and then you use some sort of hook, either a Sinsky hook or a Kuglin uh, hook, and you pull a loop out through the proximal paracentesis. I'll call the one at the top the proximal. And you pull out a little loop like that, then you can identify which of those threads goes all the way through. Um, and then you use that thread to throw a, um, a, a knot and grab that bit of proline that you've got, which is the trailing bit. And then you pull the other side, the distal side, to pull the knot onto the, the RFP thread. Like that. And then you can repeat that again. Uh, so you get your hook again, um, pass it through the parasympathesis, the proximal parasympathesis, pull out a, a loop again. And then, again, now you, you should throw that throw in the opposite direction to then create the second or locking knot. So that's the, um, the macro model which demonstrates that knot. In, in practice, it, is, it can be very fiddly. Proline is, is a bit of a nuisance to work with. Um, so here's a, a case which had a very dense cataract, and you can see there's a, 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 an RS defect superiorly. Um, this case required um, some capsule staining, and then a very dense, you can see very dense lens. And after a phaco modification and lens insertion, the, the iris was attempted to repair. So this is a 10 proline on a straight needle. So you've got a paracentesis on the right, the same paracentesis that I use for the IA, passing through the proximal leaf of the iris defect. And then to dock it into the other one, you, you can use a 19 gauge needle, which you then pass through the opposite end paracentesis, careful not to grab the cornea. These are some um, crocodile forceps to stabilize the the iris while the uh, needle goes through. And then you can pass that proline uh, needle up the shaft of that 19 gauge needle. What this does is it allows you to be sure that you're going to go through um, where you want to go through and not catch any cornea on the way out. So there you have that thread, much like the macro model. In this case, a two hook was used to 
uh, to create the loop. And it's more difficult to see, of course, because proline, proline is very fine. But you may be able to see here now on the right a loop superior to the thread. And then throwing the, uh, the throws over the um, over a pair of forceps to then pass that proline through and then pulling on from the opposite side to settle the knot. Now, in this circumstance, the second throw is done from the other side, which can sometimes make it easier so you, to, to be sure which way the throws go. So this is the second knot using, again, the Kugelin hook, passing uh, from the passing to creating a, a loop. You might see the loop there again, the little loop superior to the thread. Throwing the thread over the, uh, over the loop and then pulling from the other side Give yourself a, a second throw, and then you can repeat this as many times as you want along that defect. Uh, prior to that, you can use some some uh, vitreous scissors to cut the thread and then remove it from the eye. You can repeat that a couple of times uh, and, and create a, a nice repair for, for an eye's defect. Oh man, thank you so much. That's uh, very good. So uh, now, uh, Grant, you're going to be talking about iris repair as well, if you got your presentation, or you got your video. Right. Uh, so until uh, Grant gets ready, so question, uh, a comment here from Dr. Radwan saying that uh, phenylephrine, uh, it, when using it, when you use it neat, you get dusting. I've seen that as well. You can get dusting in the eye on the lens and on the cornea, which he says it clears away. Yeah, and I see that as well with epi sugar, uh, epi sugar cane as well. So that's a good point. Yeah, I'm not seeing that myself, but I'm aware of the potential toxicity. I'm not, I'm not seeing that dusting. Right. I think one one important point that Amon made there is when when you're passing the needle through your paracentesis, um, moving it sideways, just up and down, or right. Horizontally, yeah, it'll be coming through stops, stops you accidentally picking up a little bit of the corneal stroma, and and then having the docking needle, as Amon says, uh, coming from the other side, uh, stops you doing the same thing on the way out. Uh, it's so easy to just pick up a tiny strand of corneal stroma uh, if you don't do that maneuver, and uh, when you come to tie the knot, it, it gets caught in the section. Right, yeah, so that's exactly what I was going to say. When you do catch the arc corner, you may not be aware of it until you try and tie the knot and then it rips. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I, so I may uh, gloss over this. This is a case of uh, uh, both a, a sphincter tear as well as an irritable dialysis. Uh, FACO, this is a, a blunt trauma case. You can see here there's some. Uh, Gore-Tex uh, fixating a capsular tension segment. Uh, this is after the FACO. So I find it helpful beginning these cases to really kind of manually and uh, visco dissect um, to flatten out the pupil edge. Uh, I didn't create that aerodialysis. I was already there. Um, but as you flatten this out, you'll be able to find um, exactly how the iris is going to behave and where the suture needs to be passed. Make sure your paracentesis aligns with the direction of your needle pass. This is a tenoproline on a, on a curved needle. Um, and oftentimes, it, especially if there's an aerodialysis here, uh, you're going to need some counter traction with this second instrument. You know, micro instrumentation is key for iris cases. You really just can't do this uh, without good micro instruments. Um, and then I actually dock the needle into the viscoelastic cannula. It's the perfect size. Um, you might get a little iris uh, incarceration there, but as long as you're gentle when you're coming out, um, that iris will uh, will uh, reposit just fine. Um, and, uh, you know, this large iridodialysis, I actually made it a little bit larger during that technique, just demonstrating how careful you have to be with these cases. Um, the the iris uh, is, the, the knot is going to be um, uh, settled here using a seepter technique, which um, was demonstrated beautifully by the macro model. You know, tenoproline just rarely shows up well on a surgical video. Um, so I focus on smaller iridodialyses. I really prefer um, a horizontal mattress technique. So this is a tenoproline on a straight needle. 
Um, and you really want to engage the iris as peripheral as possible, possible, and then you just go straight out. Uh, you don't want to go too far anterior because you'll you'll end up uh, blocking some of the angle. Um, these patients are already uh, predisposed to glaucoma. It's okay if you are, if you're through the pars placata, um, and then you take the second edge of this needle. It, I didn't show it, but you know when I'm going in this incision, you have to be very careful, as was said earlier, to not. Uh, uh, engage any iris stroma, just uh, you know, one or two millimeters over on it with the second edge of the double armed needle, um, and then when you come out there, um, it'll uh, it'll cinch that down just fine. And this was a large enough aerodialysis where I actually used two separate horizontal mattress sutures, um, and uh, when that's cinched down, um, you'll see that it closes most of it. If you still have a small gap, that's okay. Um, especially depending on where the location is. This one happened to be nasally, so I did want to close as much as possible to avoid any glare or dysphotopsia. Um, and at the end of the case here, you can see um, there is maybe a little bit of peaking there. Probably one of my bites was not peripheral enough, um, but I did repair the sphincter tear with two sutures here and then the aerodialysis with uh, two sutures there. These knots, if you're just using a needle to go through the sclera, these knots are very difficult to bury, and that can sometimes be a problem. I mean, this was a young case, young young patient with very healthy tenons, and so I wasn't too worried about it. Um, but you want to leave if you're not going to bury the knot. You're going to want to leave those suture ends a little bit longer so they don't um, erode through the conjunctiva. Um, but I, I have another case um, where, <clears throat> precisely for that reason, um, this is a, an older patient with significant scarring um, of the uh, nasal conjunctiva. I was concerned that there was going to be some exposure of the knot. And so this is a case where I actually repaired the iridodialysis using an internal knot. <clears throat> the conjunctiva has already been taken down nasally. Um, there Great. Sorry to interrupt you. Can you share your, uh, you have another, you have another video, right? Or no? You guys can't see this. No. no. So again, share the other video and we'll get it. Whilst you're doing that, Grant, I suppose, would you, would you consider making a screw flap to, 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 to hide the knots afterwards? Absolutely. So I'll show that in a video here afterward. That's a great idea. Um, partial thickness scleral flap, or you can even create a little groove, um, a partial thickness groove. And it's, if you do that, you really have to, because um, it's difficult to predict where the needle is going to come out if you're using this ab internal. <laughs> and so uh, typically with the scleral flap or a groove, it's best to actually um, use a docking needle from an ab external technique um, and then dock your needle um, through that so you know precisely where it's going to come out. Grant, uh, you can see your video now if you want to play it. Yeah. Okay, so this is a, a technique where, again, small aerodialysis can repair just with a single horizontal mattress. Um, the conjunctiva has already been taken down. What I do here is that the first throw, um, as as before, uh, and and then as after this needle comes out, you just turn it around um, and go straight back in, um, just beside your first throw. I'll speed it up a little bit. So this is the exact same needle. Now I'm coming back in from the opposite side. Um, it came out a little farther posterior than I'd like there, so the second throw was a little anterior rather than beside it. Um, and then with a little counter traction here with the micro forceps, I'll engage the peripheral iris with the second throw. Um, in this case, uh, dock it to a, a needle um, to, to remove it. And then what you end up with here, uh, that needle, I had to bend it a little bit because I'm working nasally here. I had to work around the nose. Um, <clears throat> but what you end up subconjunctively is instead of a knot, you end up with just a suture loop. But key to this technique is now you have to be able to tie this knot. So I pull both of those suture ends out through the temporal incision, tie the knot, um, the first uh, three throws, and then you just take, and, and these are micro tying forceps, um, and then you just take that knot and actually manually position it into the anterior chamber, um, and then you do your tying uh, within the anterior chamber. It would have been best, as you'll see, if I had an incision here and an incision here um, to work with because it's I have to continually re-grab to actually get this tight, and it ends up putting a, a little bit of stress on the cornea here, as you can see. Um, so it would have been best to create another incision here and here. Uh, Paracentesis incisions are free, so you know you can make as many as you want here. 
Um, but as this gets tightened down, you can see that it does, you know, reposition that iris nicely. And then you can actually just make the rest of the, the uh, locking throw right there within the anterior chamber itself. Uh, this is a more technically challenging technique to actually do the tying intraocularly, intracamerally. And so, um, you know, it's not necessary just unless there's a case where you really want the knot on the inside. <clears throat> but again, at the end of the case here, um, you know, there was so much scarring of the conjunctiva there that I was happy to have, uh, you know, a knot uh, here instead of under the conjunctiva. Um, and then those are proper for uh, smaller iridodialyses, but um, for larger iridodialyses, uh, this is a, a technique that was described. Um, can you see this? Yeah, we can see your video now, Grant. Okay. So for a large iridodialysis, this, this is a, a brown iris, so it's a little bit difficult to tell, but it goes about five, almost six clock hours from here all the way to here. Um, and, you know, I have to take down the conjunctiva that, that whole way, but, um, you know, you're going to end up with five or six different horizontal mattress sutures here and figuring out a way to bury all those knots can be difficult. So uh, this is called a sewing machine technique. Um, I do make, so uh, in, in response to uh, Richard's comment, um, there is going to be a scleral flat made here. But first, this, this was not a fresh injury. So you really have to spend considerable time uh, with manual dissection and visco dissection, kind of freeing up this iris from the um, underlying lens capsule and lens implant. Um, and you can really kind of start to see the extent of it there. Um, once that's freed up, um, you know, you want to manually stretch out the iris with, uh, with two different um, instruments to, to try to uh, make sure you're really going to be engaging the peripheral iris here and not, uh, not more central so that you don't end up with any iris peaking. Um, but I find at, the, at one extent of the um, irritodialysis defect, uh, so right at this uh, edge, I'm going to create a, a partial thickness uh, a scleral tunnel here uh, with the crescent blade. And then there's a tenoproline suture actually cut off the needle and you thread the suture into a long 30 gauge needle um, that uh, you're holding by the hub. And so this is threaded all the way until you just have, uh, you know, a few millimeters um, coming out the, the distal end um, and then the proximal end uh, where the hub is, you have the remainder of the suture there. Uh, so you can see here that I have just a little bit of suture tail hanging out there. And so I'll take this and start at one, one end of the defect, use the 30 gauge needle to engage the peripheral iris, and then just go straight across and come out the sclera. The conjunctiva has already been taken down. I'll come out the sclera. And I'll fast forward a little bit here, and just until the tip of the needle comes out. And once the tip of the needle comes out, um, you grab the suture and hold on to it while you're withdrawing the needle. And so that leaves one free tail of the proline suture right there. And then don't remove this needle from the eye. Say that again, sorry. No, I'm sorry, that was an interruption from a video, sorry. Okay, um, and don't remove the needle from the eye, just go one or two millimeters over, engage peripheral iris here, and again, uh, I'll fast forward a little bit, um, and then you come out through the sclera there, and then you pull out a little loop of suture here. You gotta be careful during this step. Uh, I left a very long tail out of the first one so that as I pull out that loop, I'm not withdrawing the tail back into the eye. Hold on to that loop as you pull the needle back, and then you repeat that every one or two millimeters uh, going across the length of that defect so that you have multiple loops coming out of the, uh, out of the sclera there. Um, and then the very last uh, throw here at the other edge of the defect uh, externalizes from beneath that scleral tunnel that I created, and then I pull the entire suture out of the needle here so that I have the second free end. So there's one tail there, there's one tail at the other end, and then the throws in between are loops, but that's all one suture. And I'll take this forcep and go through all of the loops and grab my tail on the, on the first end. Okay. 
And once I've, uh, I'll speed it up a little bit here. Once I have that tail, I'll pull it through each of those loops and tie it back to the other end. And, and since that other end is, is coming out from beneath that scleral tunnel, this knot will slide nicely um, underneath that scleral tunnel. Uh, it's, it's tough to see the proline here. Uh, it's always tough, but it's especially tough here because of the blood. Um, you have to, uh, you know, manually kind of tighten down each of these uh, loops as you're um, kind of working your way across. But again, as I, as I tie that down there, the knot's going to slide underneath that scleral flap nicely so I don't have anything to erode. Um, and so here, after repairing all of that, rather than having a knot here and a knot there and a knot there and a knot there, uh, the only place you would possibly be worried about exposure is that <laughs> one knot, and that's uh, buried underneath the, uh, the scleral tunnel. It's very nice, Grant, but uh, I just find suturing the iris uh, really tricky. You know, I, 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 suturing the iris, um, I think the key is, as it has been said before, you just have to be very gentle. So, yeah. I mean, you saw me there create a larger iridodialysis on that first case. So um, you have to be gentle. You have to use a, a really good ergonomics um, and, uh, and, and, you know, just don't, don't, um, you know, don't be afraid to use a little more viscoelastic to clear up your view. So Abdallah, do you like using uh, straight needles or curved needle for the repair? Sorry, is that for me? Do you use straight needles when you do iris repair. Do you do iris repairs when you do them? Do you use straight needles or curved needles? We've seen uh, Grant using mainly straight needles. I usually use curved needles. I find that often easier. As you know, I usually set also uh, on the top. So I think it's a little bit easier if you have the problem uh, on either side. But uh, the opposite occurs if you are setting temporarily. Right. Richard, what do you do? Is straight needle or curved needle? Uh, well, for a dialysis, I tend to use a straight needle because you can go, just as Grant has showed really elegantly there, you can go straight across in the correct plane, and yeah. and, and that's really nice. Um, if, there's a, if there's a segmental defect in the iris, um, I tend to use the curved ones because it gives you that flexibility to control pass down through one end of the wound and then out through the other and into your docking needle, and, and it, and it it's easier to sort of pass the suture through uh, like that if you're not going out through the sclera. Yeah, that's a real great tip. So uh, segmental for iris, localized iris, de sorry, uh, for segmental defects, a curved needle and a straight for iris dialysis. A man, you're, uh, uh, you like the straight needle, right? Or... I don't like any of them, to be honest. But I prefer the straight one because I feel that I, I can direct it a bit more in, in some more controlled fashion. But, you know. Right. Exactly. With the straight needles, you can bend them or tweak them a little bit uh, in whatever direction you want. <clears throat> Grant, you were going to show us on circlage. I have a quick question for Grant. So if you have a combination of iridodialysis dialysis and iris defect, you showed up, uh, you repaired the iris defect first and then the iridodialysis dialysis second. What, what, what if you do it in the opposite way? Repair the dialysis first and then the defect later? You know, that probably would have been a good idea um, in hindsight, you know, uh, but as you can see, uh, sometimes with an ear, when you have a combination of defects, um, you can enlarge the iridodialysis a little bit. And so I, I figured whatever damage I'd create during the first step, I could fix during the second step. Um, but you know, with with the iridodialysis repair, it created a little bit of peaking there, and and that might have been easier to repair um, as I was uh, fixing the uh, the iris sphincter defect. Great, Grant. So you're saying uh, dialysis first or uh, segmental first? Honestly, I don't really think it matters. Um, I, I I think if you're using proper technique, uh, you could probably do either one first. Right. Okay, Grant. I think I think um, one thing that Grant showed nicely there is when you're putting your needle through the iris if you can grasp it with a pair of forceps you yes. know a little um to provide some counter traction so you're not you know pulling on the iris root and making the dialysis bigger because it, often you know the iris can be really friable and if you can give it some counter traction that minimizes the forces that are being applied everywhere else 
All right. Can you see this? Can you see this video now? Uh, yes. Okay. So this is a cerclage. Um, this is probably the most technically challenging iris surgery that I, that I, I do. Um, and, and again, it's not very fun. Um, <clears throat> you want to both manually and pharmacologically constrict the pupil. Um, so what I find helpful with these micro forceps is to grab, uh, well across the, the, uh, pupil border and for 360 degrees, just sort of, uh, constrict it. That helps uh, stretch out the iris. And you can see here, I had a little bit of irritable corneal adhesion that I uh, dissected off to make it nice and round. Excuse the blood. I had angle surgery, uh, before this. And so there's a little bit of reflux blood from that. Um, so ergonomically it's best. And then again, this is a tenoproline on a curved needle. Um, ergonomically you want to leave the needle still. And so what I have an incision, um, I have an, uh, a main incision. This is a FACO as well. Uh, so temporal, uh, 2.2 millimeter incision here. And then I've got actually three, uh, or even four, uh, different paracentesis incisions. Um, you know, scattered around here, um, you, you're going to split this pupil up into, into three or even four segments to do this. Um, and so leave the needle still and you use your micro forceps to bring the edge of the pupil to the needle. Um, this is a technique where if you're trying to move that needle, you can really easily create an iridodialysis uh, and it can be quite difficult to, to, to use the needle to engage the pupil so many different times. But the more bites, the better, um, because it'll avoid a scalloped appearance to the pupil. So really, I mean, at most every millimeter or so, you want to be uh, taking another bite. You can just bring the edge of the pupil to the tip of the needle, wrap it around, um, and then you'll, uh, you know, occasionally have to uh, use your second instrument to, to push the ir iris up on the needle um, to create a little more space at the tip. Um, but as you're, as you're doing this, you know, you just take your time, um, and, uh, wrap it over and over again. And then once you've kind of reached the extent of where you can work with that, uh, you're going to externalize that needle. Um, uh, again, I dock it to, um, uh, viscoelastic cannula here. So I'll dock it to the viscoelastic cannula, making very, very sure that I don't um, engage in corneal fibers as I'm coming in and out of this incision, because I'm going to come out here and then I'm going to go right back in to work on this segment. Um, you have to use, this technique is tough because you have to use a combination of your left and right hand holding the needle, both in forehand and backhand configurations. Um, but as I come out there um, and then, and then I'll, I'll do this third segment um, and end up back where I started, um, so I started this from this main incision here, and it's important to end up back at the main incision there with the last throw. So I split this up into three segments. And so you already saw this, uh, this technique uh, of uh, tying the first knot outside. And then once you have that triple throw, um, you actually just manually uh, place the knot into the eye and then grab the two suture ends, ideally from paracentesis incisions that are situated directly across from where you're tying. Um, and then I didn't show it, but you know, I did the other two locking throws um, just right inside the AC. Um, and you wanna aim for, with the cerclage, you wanna aim for about a four millimeter. <laughs> that, that, that's kind of the sweet spot. You can still see the retina, but um, you know, it's small enough to, to be smaller than optic of the IOL and avoid glare. Um, you can see this is why it's important to take the bites as close together. So these bites are really close together. That's a nice smooth edge. These bites are a little farther apart and you got a little scalloping there. And uh, some particularly discerning patients will uh, will let you know about that scalloping. That's a very elegant grant. Uh, looks very nice. I The circlage is not my game really. I remember a couple of cases where I ended up with corneal bites after nearly an hour of work. So I thought that's not for me. So usually I would take four sutures, or and that's that's enough. Yeah. Richard, do you like? Uh, do you have experience with the circlage? Who was? Did you, you ask me? Circlage, Richard. You do. Uh, um, I I don't do it very often actually. Um, I I tend to just put two little sutures yes. um, on either side, and, and you get a little diamond shaped, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. But. Yeah, no, that's a uh, very nice, very elegant uh, grant. Okay, uh, Grant, if you, um, 
let me show uh, my technique of uh, doing something similar on a, a patient with a I read the dialysis and the cycle dialysis. Just one second, I'll share my screen. Uh, just a quick question, Grant. Uh, which forceps do you use? The micro forceps. Those are the Ahmed micro forceps from MST, um, as well as the micro tires. Um, you know, I've used different forceps. I, I like the Ahmed micro grasping forceps because they they come together uh, very at a very fine tip. They don't and they don't. Um, it's almost like a. It's not a tooth tip, but it behaves like a tooth forceps where you're not crushing the tissue. Yeah, thank you. They're really nice, actually. And very nice demo of the circulage, actually. Again, it's my game as well. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sharing uh, the screen. What, one more question. Did you try the fourth row of Ubilibilasti? Because uh, question for you and man. Because it's recent, recently getting very popular to switch as iris defect, so which proposed by Agarwal. I have a video on that. Oh, good. Yeah. I've got a video of that as well um, that I uh, I borrowed off the All India Symposium that was on a couple of days ago. Right. So they've got a lovely animation of it, which makes it understandable. Yeah, that's, I think, what I'm going to show as well. So uh, this is a 10-year-old child that we did. Did you ask their permission, Ahmed? Uh, I'm, I'm showing it off the American Academy website, so I think ah, right. okay. for um, like everyone's use, as long as we acknowledge them, that's my thinking. Yeah. And so a 10-year-old boy who was shot with a BB gun, and he had decreased vision down to 2260 uh, 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 because of uh, hypotenuse maculopathy, very hypotony, uh, very bad hypotony five, and that's his injury here. Can you can you share the screen, please? Share the your screen, please. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. I do apologize. Share screen. Yeah, I'm sorry. So we got hypotenuse and uh, maculopathy. Which actually, we had another uh, picture on him, and that's here with the uh, when at the time of the operation, we couldn't see the cycle dialysis for sure, but we expected it will be somewhere there. So actually, we did a bit of uh, cycle diode in this area to try to to close the cycle dialysis, uh, and then we also wanted to add surgery as well. So this is a flap, uh, and then the problem is this patient is faking, and that's the problem. So it's really it was very difficult. And I think we didn't help ourselves as well. And here we're looking again, uh, putting the gonio lens and trying to deep the, deepen the AC to try to see the hypodialysis. We saw an area which was suspicious, but there was too much blood. But we thought it's probably definitely in this area. Uh, now, vitreous in the AC and the lenses, the, some of the zonules are damaged, but the patient has clear lens. Uh, putting the iris back. Iris is becoming very thin and atrophic. And I think here where we didn't help ourselves, we were using in this fake patient a curved uh, needle, and that was difficult. But again, using the same technique where we go outside under the flap, and again, because it's uh, a curved needle on a fake patient, that was difficult. And then we go again from the same paracentesis with the other needle and um, another bite next to it. And then similar here, and we're trying to put things together. It's and difficult when the, hit, when the heel of the needle Yes. Out, yeah, really we, I mean, luckily we didn't hit the lens, but I think, I mean, in hindsight, especially in phagic patients, and I think in pseudophagic patients, it seems for our dialysis, a straight needle is much better. That's what I felt. I always use the curved needle for segmental defects, but uh, I feel for our dialysis, the, the straight needle is much better. But then I think there was too really much iris damage, and by the end, when we put the dialysis back, the iris became 
very nicely pear shaped. So we thought, okay, well, we need to close the dialysis. Uh, trying to round the pupil is very noble, but maybe we shouldn't like, okay, well, let's just close the diaz. But then we thought, okay, well, let's try to put a suture to in the iris, see if we can get the iris more rounded or in a better position, but at least like smaller. So that's here the same technique that a man and uh, Grant showed, where we're fixing with the needle and the forceps docking here. I think the difficulty, again, this is a fake guy. And then we did the same technique of like trying to do a C-sir knot. I use the forceps. I find it much easier than the Kuglin hook. <coughs> and then we have the loop here. Now we're doing the four throw. And just in any direction, you just go do a four throw around the loop in the same direction. That was described by well. So we're looping here through the loop, which is really much easier because then you don't need to remember which direction you went through um, as in the seep, so which I really find it difficult to remember. And the pupil looks much better, slightly still pear shaped, but much better. And we use the cutter to cut the suture. And that's what we ended up with. And we thought this is fine. And this kid actually did very well. And the pressure went up to 20 and his hypotenuse maculopathy corrected very nicely. Uh, I'll show a, just a quick slide. And here, this is uh, just to acknowledge this from the American Academy website by uh, Amar Agarwal. <coughs> I'm sorry. Apologize, we'll, uh... oh, man, I've got that video if you want me to. Uh, if, you can, if you can share it, it would be very good. I, for some reason, it just escaped, really. While you're pulling that up, I, I'd like to address the question um, from YouTube. Uh, in Sir Claude, if the patient has a retina issue, what's the solution? How can we examine the patient? Um, again, don't make it, most of the vast majority of these patients are uh, pseudophagic. Um, only surgeons as brave as Dr. Salam will uh, do this on phagic patients. Um, but most of the time, they have a clear lens. As long as your pupil is about four millimeters or larger, usually uh, examining the retina is not too bad, at least for a glaucoma surgeon. Yeah. So, uh, Richard, you will show that video when you. Yeah, I'll, I'll show it. I'll show it in a minute. Okay. Um, All right. okay. one, answer to, one answer to the, the question, you know, examining the retina, if I, I understand, I've never done this, but I understand that if you, if you had to see out into the peripheral retina, um, uh, you can laser the suture, your circular suture, which can help release it, I think. Uh, yeah, and uh, the other thing, really, which is very important because we deal with that with uveitic patients is Optus. Optus gets you a beautiful picture through a very small pupil. So really, you don't need to do anything. You get like a beautiful picture. But I think as Grant said, don't make it too, too small um, because that makes things a bit difficult. All right, Grant, if we can go to your case of the uh, cycle dialysis, please. And then we'll have Richard showing the four uh, plus as well with his technique. Yeah, I think even if a smaller pupil up to small up to four millimeter, you can still a good uh, get a decent view of the periphery up to the equator or anterior to the equator. Yeah. One thing also you can do, you can try to do a couple of diathermy to the iris itself. This may shrink the iris stroma, makes the pupil a little bit larger. You can repeat that in different clock hours give you slightly larger pupil. It may help sometimes. Yeah. Um, so uh, can we see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So so uh, as Dr. Salam mentioned, uh, you know, medical management is, uh, is usually successful for small cyclodialysis uh, cases. Um, this patient failed uh, atropine. Uh, we also did um, 
uh, cyclophotocoagulation uh, in the clinic using a green laser and a gonio lens. Um, and uh, that also didn't work. Um, so we come to the operating room. This is a fake patient. So I'm lucky I didn't have any iris defects to address. And so we can really do this uh, without entering the anterior chamber. Um, gonioscopy is critical to managing these, uh, both clinical and intraoperative. Uh, you showed a beautiful video of that. I have, uh, I didn't show it here, but I, I used gonioscopy intraoperatively to mark the extent of the cycle valve cleft here and here. And what I'm going to do to start with is create a scleral flap, partial thickness scleral flap um, hinged at the limbus that encompasses the entire extent of the cleft. In this case, it's uh, a, a little over two clock hours. Um, and I'll speed it up here. Um, so this is a, a direct cyclopexy. So we're actually going to cut down all the way to the ciliary body. And, and what you want to do here is, is just kind of know your landmarks. So you have the blue line here, the, uh, where the cornea ends and the sclera begins. And then just posterior to that is going to be the external um, border of the scleral spur. And, that, and that's really where, where you want to be cutting down is at or slightly posterior to the scleral spur here. If, if you're up here, you're going to be going through, um, you know, the angle and possibly entering into the, the anterior chamber. Uh, and I don't do this with the vast switch to kind of a steel blade here because because I don't want to be too sharp. I don't actually want to cut down um, into the ciliary body. You see a little egress of fluid there. So this is clear fluid. This is aqueous. This is aqueous that's gone through the defect in the superciliary space. It's not the straw colored fluid that you get in chronic choroidal effusions. And we cut down until you get to ciliary body. You see the gray color of the of the ciliary uh, ciliary body there, and then I have a tino uh, nylon suture here. I'll um, and then you're gonna basically sew up the cut that you've created. But with the second bite, you actually take a bite of the ciliary body, and you want to take a bite about every millimeter or so. Um, again, uh, incorporating ciliary body into the into the suture throw itself. And then you just tie these uh, sutures tightly, basically. And what it does is it, uh, it'll uh, close the scleral uh, incision that you've created and it will reoppose the ciliary body internally um, to the, uh, the sclera right where your incision is. Um, so I've uh, <clears throat> tied all these down, rotated the knots, and then you can close the scleral and conjunctival flap uh, however you want. Uh, this was a patient who had decreased vision um, as a result of hypotony maculopathy. Uh, um, he was fake -ick. He had uh, anterior uh, lens shift because of shallow anterior chamber myopic shift. Um, and that all resolved af after, uh, after um, several months, uh, slowly after improving the hypotony with this uh, cyclodialysis repair. Grant, this is fantastic. Can you show up? Can you get your video again for after dissection of the scare flap? I think that it seems like um, the difficulty is mainly, if you can get your video back again. Yeah. Uh, I think the difficulty is identifying where to cut. So you're saying we can see all the bluish color. It's clear. Right. So before you cut, we can see the bluish here. Right. But how far backward would you go? Because we don't know really... We can understand how you calculate it, where the scare spare is and going backward. So it teach us this. It doesn't matter how far, you just don't want to be too far anterior. So um, you, you should be behind this, the, the UVL show, right? All the so so what, what you're actually seeing here is you're seeing uh, the corneal fibers and things are starting to be a little more transparent. So you can see through uh, to the color of the iris beneath. Um, and so, you know, the scleral spur, it's a little bit difficult to see in this video because it's a relatively superficial flap. And right. if you have a deeper flap, sometimes you can see the scleral spur a little bit better. But um, where the blue ends is basically the very beginning of the scleral spur. And you want to be at or posterior to that. Okay. That's a very good tip. You don't want to be entering the anterior chamber. And you can go really as, I mean, you can go a little bit farther back if you want to, but you want to be at or just posterior to the scleral spur here. And if you make, honestly, if you make about a, a three, three and a half millimeter flap here and you go all the way up into uh, into the cornea here, it'll end up being right about in the center. Now, the, the extent circumferentially, you, you mark that out with gonioscopy intraoperatively, presumably. 
Exactly. So I knew where it was from clinical gonioscopy. But, um, I don't show it here, but you, you can see that I've got a, a mark there and there. Yeah. And I've, I've uh, deepened the anterior chamber with viscoelastic um, and used a mirrored gonio lens to see precisely where I need to go. That's very beautiful. Uh, so Richard, if you want to get your uh, slides up, please. And as we yeah, sure. get your slides up, uh, we have a very good comment from Dr. Rodwan who's uh, in the UK as well. Um, and he's saying he repaired one with the endoscope. We really need to see this video. If you'd be kind to attach a copy of the video to the Facebook or the YouTube or the Facebook page would be fantastic. That would be great to see, Mahmoud. Thank you so much. Right, as we're wait, waiting for uh, Richard's slides, uh, any any comments from the- Can you see my screen there? Can no, you see my screen there on it? I, not yet. Okay, hold on. Yeah, it would be very neat to see an endoscopic uh, repair of cyclodialysis. Have you done this more shedding before? I, I have not. Um, I, I, I think it would have been a good thing to try in this patient if he wasn't phakic. Yes, you're right. I think that's the problem. I've been trying to use the endoscope more often and we got, we got it. Uh, Richard, we still cannot see your slides. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, yes, maybe. Uh, Grant, can you do stop share if you're still sharing? Maybe yeah, this is preventing it. I'm not sure it is, but uh, I'm not. Mine stopped. Yeah. Can you see it now or not? No. Um, okay, I'm just going to try again. So, um, application window. Share. Yes, yes, I can see it. You can see it now? Yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say I've got no financial disclosures. Um, so why do we try and make the pupil smaller? I just thought I'd quickly say we we uh, want to improve the comfort for the patient, reduce glare, dazzle, and photophobia. Uh, but also there are optical benefits um, of having a small pupil. Um, you have the pinhole effect producing aberrations from the periphery of the lens and you improve the depth of focus uh, for the patient as well um, because the rays of light are much more parallel when the pupil is smaller. When there's a widely dilated pupil, you've got very converging rays and, and therefore the depth of focus uh, is uh, much greater with a small pupil. Um, we know that uh, when people have had trauma, uh, they can suffer psychosocial distress from this and um, patients that have facial differences often get um, a considerable distress um, uh, from this and people look at them and they get very anxious about it so this kind of thing uh, is a, a poorly functioning eye but people will constantly sort of stare at it and ask them about it as similar to this I'll show you in a minute just while I do to repair this um, this lady that had uh, trauma that occurred at work, somebody uh, in her, one of her colleagues dropped uh, a large object on her eye and uh, she lost the entire iris and uh, the lens, but amazingly the retina was still intact and um, uh, people would ask her on a daily basis, what's wrong with your eye? And every time she was looked in the mirror, she um, had flashbacks to it. Um, and, you know, there's, there's been quite a bit of uh, evidence there that psychosocial, there are psychosocial benefits to having um, disfiguring things such as um, bad strabismus or ptosis or and patients uh, can have an improvement in their quality of life if you correct these uh, and, and it's, it's to be assumed I think that the same would apply for this type of thing. So when I look at this kind of patient it's, it's worth having a, a good look uh, to try and suss out how much of the iris is actually missing. Uh, there isn't a huge amount of iris missing here. There's a bit of atrophy at the edge of this big dialysis, um, but uh, the pupil's obviously dilated due to traumatic midriasis with, with sphincter ruptures. And if there's not a huge amount of missing iris, you can do the repairs that have already been uh, demonstrated. And um, as has uh, just been explained, uh, close, I'd probably do this in two stages, close the dialysis first and then once, once you've got the pupil centered, you can then think about how you're going to reduce the pupil size. And, and I would tend to um, produce little um, uh, little Hoffman pockets um, 
with a partial thickness incision at the limbus and then undermining the um, sclera uh, in the plane of the sclera with a crescent blade and and then I would use a straight double armed needle to pass through the periphery of the iris and then out through the Hoffman pocket out onto the surface of the eye and, and then repeating that with the other needle on the other end of the suture in a mattress type um, method and, and then the needles can be cut off and a blunt instrument can be passed inside the Hoffman pocket to sweep the sutures onto the surface and uh, then you can tighten the, the suture and pull the iris over and I probably you know one of that size we would have had to have had a couple of these pockets there. I was thinking actually um, when Grant was speaking about having sutures on the surface uh, and particularly the knots eroding um, David Steele, who's um, based in Sunderland in the UK, he often talks about the ZZ sutures, which are, are a quite nice way of anchoring uh, a suture under tension without creating any knot at all. You just literally pass your needle through the sclera uh, and then back on itself, a bit like um, a, a zigzag road. And I think three or four turns of the suture is enough to put friction in it to to stop the suture coming out and then you don't need any knot at all uh, and also the, the suture is less likely to break as long as you don't touch the suture itself and then um, usually I do a couple of steeps of sliding walks as has been shown by um, previously and um, and you end up getting a, a, a similar kind of appearance to, to this um, so you end up with a sort of a diamond shape um, iris here. So this is the, the video shown by uh, the single pass four throw papilla pasty described by Narang and Agrawal. And um, this little video shows this nicely. So a single pass goes through and you pull a loop through and then you literally put four throws through it and then tighten and cut. So I'll just show that again and then you don't have to worry about which end you're picking up. You don't have to worry about having a locking suture, a locking throw. Just pull out the loop, four throws through, and then tighten. So that's a nice way of doing that. Richard, that four throws, yeah. the, 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 just one of the one arm of the loop, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So um, again, Yeah. So they actually they actually put the throws on the 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 arm that goes back to the iris, but I think it, it would be fine for it to be on the other side of the loop, and um, because it, you're not having to worry about um, doing it in the opposite direction to lock it. So one caveat with this type of procedure, not I don't know if anybody else has come across this, but I've had a few patients that um, the iris just won't tolerate being suture and you, you often don't know beforehand and it can sort of cheese wire through so you get the first pass and then it starts sort of tearing like this and um, and, and this is obviously a suboptimal result for the patient. So what are the options when there's a large amount of missing iris? So in this case you've got you know about half the iris is, is missing it, it exited through the uh, corneoscleral rupture there along with the lens and um, that there's, if you look closely on the slit lamp, you can see that the, the remaining sphincter went from about there to there. And, um, you know, these types of um, Morsha lenses have been around for a long time and uh, uh, they uh, can be fitted into the capsular bag or they can be sutured um, with scleral fixation sutures and uh, they can also have various sizes of pupils and uh, an IOL incorporated. Um, the problem with, with these things is that they've got to go in through a very large corneal incision, you know, over 10 millimeters. And uh, when they're in, they're uh, nice and stable, but if you've sutured, eventually the sutures can break because there's a lot of um, yawing goes on and then that eventually can damage and, and the, the complex can become unstable. Uh, an alternative to that is these um, capsular tension ring type 
uh, devices with these little pens on them and they, these can go into a much smaller wound uh, inside a capsular bag and then you rotate them around so that the pains are alternating. Um, the downside of these is that the pupil size is pretty big and um, also they can rotate within the capsular bag uh, so that light starts coming through uh, the gaps. So that's not ideal. Um, Offtech and Artisan have had these lenses around for many years as well. Often they can be multiple pieces that go in the bag with eye wells incorporated or, or sutured and they come in a range of colors. Uh, the, the, the feature of them though is that they've got a, a, a smooth front surface and uh, you can get reflections that come off that and uh, the Artisan version actually clips to any remaining iris. Uh, but as I said this, this uh, anterior surface because it's smooth, uh, reflects quite prominently from light coming from certain directions. Um, so that's sort of less than ideal uh, in some circumstances. So, you know, I think it's good to try and aim to replicate the normal anatomy and function as much as possible. So what do we actually want from a prosthetic iris? So ideally we'd want something that's foldable uh, so we can put it through a small incision. So we've got a strong wound and rapid recovery and less astigmatism. Um, we want to be able to place it in the sulcus or in the capsular bag. Uh, we want to be able to size it to different size eyes. Um, ideally, we want a realistic appearance that mimics the natural iris so it doesn't draw attention to the eye. Uh, it would be good to be able to suture it if we need to. And um, also, I think it's best not to have too many moving parts, uh, multiple components, if it's all one single component. And then finally, I think it, it's probably best to be separate from the IOL, so we can change the IOL power easily, uh, change the diopter the material, or, or if we had to change the location of the IOL, uh, we wouldn't want to have to change the entire um, iris prosthesis as well. So human optics produced the artificial iris about eight years ago now it's got fda approval in recent years uh, for use in the us and these are handmade um, devices that um, are foldable and made from bi biocompatible silicon and uh, the iris can be color matched to the other eye uh, so to reduce um, uh, the attention being drawn to the eye and the color composition and also the structure of the iris um, make it very realistic. The, the anterior structure, front surface, has got a sort of corrugated texture, so this breaks up the instant light so you don't get reflections off it. And the silicon has, um, you can have this fiber within it, which allows you to put a suture through and it then doesn't cheese wire through. So how much does this thing cost? Well. You know, we've known for a long time that prosthetic limbs and prosthetic eyes can be very expensive. Um, in the UK, it costs £2,500 plus VAT, which is the tax that we've got in the UK. Um, and it, that might seem expensive, but it's really just the cost of three anti-VEGF injections, which um, would, you know, be worn off after three or four months, whereas this kind of thing would hopefully be a benefit for the rest of the patient's life. Um, in the UK, we have to have exceptional funding applications to fund this kind of thing. So uh, just a little bit of advice, if you're filling in one of these things, really focus on the functional benefits for the patient, you know, the reduced dazzle and glare and photophobia, the safety of that when driving, you know, improved contrast sensitivity, improved depth of field, and improved acuity from the pinhole effect and reduced spherical aberrations. No matter how frustrating it gets, though, um, the form, don't use the C word, which of course is cosmesis, because uh, the people reviewing these applications, they won't understand the nuances of it. And if they, if they see that, uh, you, that it's, it's got cosmetic benefits, they'll just assume it's a cosmetic procedure. So I would not even mention this uh, and really focus on the functional benefits for the patient. So um, many of these patients have got lens damage or no lens at all in their eye. And, and the first stage of treating these would be to have 
uh, an IOL fixation of some kind. You know, historically we've um, put sutured IOLs in, but I think we're all moving away from these now because of the uh, eventual breakage of the suture. Um, the, the Yamani technique is is quite popular, and there's also um, a new um, specialized IOL designed for scleral fixation called the Carlevale lens, which I'll show you in a moment. And uh, the principle is to have a two-point fixation of your IOL, and then the artificial iris code goes on top of it and is then itself fixated. So in, in effect, overall, there's four-point fixation for the whole complex. So uh, looking in this cross-section, the blue block here is the artificial iris. And uh, you can see that it's supposed to be in the sulcus, so posterior to the iris or any iris remnant, and anterior to the IOL. And um, the placement of the sutures is really important uh, with the artificial iris because we don't want to do anything that's going to make the edge of the artificial iris impinge on the angle or the uh, endothelium. So the sutures are pre-placed into the artificial iris out when it's outside the eye. Um, sutures are passed from the posterior surface. So you've got a double-armed uh, suture posterior surface first out through the anterior surface and then it passes out through the wall of the eye and yeah, the exit point should be uh, about two and a half millimeters back from the limbus uh, within a, a scleral flap and uh, the second pass then does exactly the same thing and, and then the suture as it's passing out over the uh, edge of the artificial iris and you want to have at least a millimeter or two between the suture pass and the edge of the implant. That keeps the edge of it down, stops it impinging anteriorly. Uh, the second feature is that the IOL, normally we would put our fixation sutures or our haptic fixation uh, more anteriorly than this. Um, but because of the um, artificial iris, we need the IOL further back. So that has to be three millimeters back from the limbus. And consequently, you'd have to correct for the lens power. Um, so you want to be aiming about a diopter and a half more myopic than um, you would normally. So this is the Carlo Vale lens um, that's been available for a couple of years. And the nice thing about this lens is that it has a little um, peg that comes out and the T-shape on the end. And this little peg goes through your sclerostomy and you've previously dissected uh, some scleral pockets. And when the little T comes out, it's, it's nice and flexible. It's, it's made of um, acrylic and it comes out easily. And these pass into the little pockets. And the second feature is that the haptic here is a bit like a spring, which allows the um, uh, fixation points to be further or, or closer together, depending on the size of the eye. Uh, and the little wings also stabilize it in an anterior posterior position so it doesn't tilt. Uh, it's available in a wide range of powers and uh, you can also have toric uh, versions as well. So if you've got a patient with a very high sill. So you, either way, you end up with your eye well with two point fixation. And as I said, you then put your artificial iris on top of it to make it four point fixation with its spheral sutures. So um, this video shows um, a case that has a, a, a scleral fixated IOL already. So there's the IOL in place and um, there's lots of missing iris here. So um, the artificial iris goes in, a second instrument comes in through the side. So when it's unfolding, it doesn't impinge on the endothelium at all. And it, it, they're very straightforward and easy to use. It's just like putting a lens in, really, except that you have to encourage it to fold and fold from, from behind. And this has had sutures pre-placed in it already, as I mentioned. And then you come in with your docking needle and pass. I use a curved tenoproline and passes out through previously dissected scleral pockets. And then same 180 degrees opposite. So 
So I'm showing this to um, tell you not to do what I've just done there. Um, so this patient had a bit of macular edema as well, so I thought I'd be clever and put a uh, Ozidex implant in. The problem with these um, cases is that even though you've created a nice new lens iris diaphragm, uh, it's not um, like a normal situation. And these implants, um, Ozidex implants, will get into the anterior chamber of the eye and can potentially damage the cornea very rapidly. Uh, so never put an Ozidex implant uh, in an aphakic eye like this, uh, even though you've created a new diaphragm there, because they always make their way through. Even actually just a, quite a broad PI, they'll come through one of those as well. So this was pre -optionally. And this is the post-op appearance in this lady. And um, you can see the pupil size, this is the operated eye. The, the pupil size is slightly larger than that, but um, she was much, much more comfortable and um, much more reduced glare. And actually her fixation um, picked up as well because uh, when, when the pupil was uh, absent completely, the eye tended to drift out so she had no fusion. So this next case is um, a patient that's had obviously trauma, but their uh, lens was intact, completely intact. Zonules were strong and um, uh, cataract surgery was needed. So in this circumstance, rather than putting a scleral or sulcus fixated, we're gonna put it in the capsular bag. And the secret of doing this is that you've got to put your um, blue dye in to stain your capsule, because you want to make a very, you know, quite an accurate six millimeter capsular axis. You don't want it bigger than six millimeter because the um, artificial iris can uh, prolapse into the AC and you don't really want it smaller than six millimeters because that can make it hard to get it in. Uh, so um, aim for six millimeters. So I, I created a little um, intraocular um, ruler uh, with, with a measuring caliper. So that's me measuring my capsulorexis. See the capsulorexis has been made there and the phaco is formed. And the next stage is to put a capsular tension ring in because this helps prevent capsule contraction and extrusion of the implant. And the IOL goes on top of that. And then the um, artificial eyes is trefined. And uh, generally speaking, most eyes you trefine it to nine and a half millimeters with corneal trefine. You can insert this into a, a standard cartridge or B cartridge. And when you're injecting, you have to make sure that the, the anterior surface is upright with the pupil upright. And this is when the dye on the capsule is important. So you can see that you've definitely got it in. And then when it's in the capsular bag, you can open it up with an instrument anterior to, to stop it impinging on the endothelium. And this step here is quite important because the trailing part of the artificial iris isn't actually in the bag yet. It's the, the, the rexus is down here. Uh, so you have to then come in, have a paracentesis diametrically opposite, and you come in with a pair of micro grasping forceps and you pull the edge of the artificial iris and then that will um, reduce its overall diameter, allowing you to ease the edge uh, inside the capsular rexus. You'll see that in just a second. So that's now in the bag, and then we're just closing this inferior iridodialysis dialysis here with a straight needle, and then a curved needle to close the remaining defect. So, um, so that's the uh, post-op review a couple of days later. Um, you can see there's still a gap at the top here, um, but his upper upper lid is there, and that will um, prevent the light coming in through there. So what if you've got a large amount of missing iris and a fake here, but you don't want to put a um, sutured or a sclerofixated IOL? And this video is from quite a long time ago now, um, before I started, before Yamane um, uh, technique was announced and before the Kalevale lens was um, available. And uh, I've never been keen on sutured IOLs. So, um, I wanted to put a artisan iris clip lens, and 
Uh, I wanted to use the, the residual um, iris that's present to put an artisan lens on the back surface. So, so the pass plane of vitrectomy had been performed because the um, uh, vitreous hemorrhage was removed previously as well. And we came up with this technique that we call the bowstring technique. So what we're doing is we're putting a suture from the remains of the sphincter muscle here across to the other end of it here, and then looping back through again. So that there's a continuous bowstring um, between the two ends of uh, the remaining sphincter. And the purpose of that would be to allow me to center the pupil back onto the visual axis. And we do that by passing a needle at right angles to it, that are called the drawstring. And, uh, and fixating that to the sclera. So this is the second pass. And this is the drawstring going underneath and out through into pockets. And this is going above. So, that was then tied off on the sclera on this side. The bowstring is tied off secondarily. And then when traction is applied, that then centers the pupil. I did a PI, I don't know why I did a PI. But, uh, and then the, then the artisan lens is placed. So um, I'm a great fan of putting the artisan lens on the posterior surface of the iris. Um, and when you do that, you have to uh, make sure it's turned around the other way so that it's vaulted posteriorly. Uh, and you, you change the A constant uh, so it's the, the right lens power. And it's actually much easier to, to enclavate the iris into the claws when it's on the posterior surface because you just come in with a viscoelastic cannula and um, just press down into the claw and then the lens is there. And then this is the artificial iris. The, the nice thing about them is you can cut them to uh, the, the size that you want. I've actually made it a bit too big here. I'm putting the, the pre-placed stitches in first, and then you can use those to drag them into position. You see it's very easy to use, and then a, a suture is placed through uh, the pupil margin. Sorry, I, I advanced it too quickly. Here. I'll just show you that again. So these are the pre-placed stitches being put in. It's going in through a relatively small corneal wound. And then at the pupil margin. And so effectively what just to recap, the bowstring is put in first and then the drawstring pulls to the other side and that's fixated. The eye well is positioned on the back surface uh, of the remaining healthy retina, a healthy, um, healthy iris and then the artificial iris is put on top. And there's three point fixation to the sclera. The inferior and the superior one, they're pre-placed sutures uh, the nasal one was um, a suture had to be passed through secondarily. You have more than two sutures, it, it all gets in a horrible tangle. Uh, so you're much better off just um, putting the third suture in um, when it's inside the eye. And then, uh, and then finally a suture at the pupil margin. So even if the bowstring and the drawstring break in the future, uh, the artificial iris uh, should stay stable uh, because of these sutures. And um, this is after about a week. You see the color match wasn't, looks better on the high magnification than it does on the um, low magnification. It wasn't a fantastic color match. And that's it, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Richard, very interesting. Uh, Grant, do you have any experience with the uh, a human, a human flex iris. 
It has been FDA approved, but we can still cannot get it for the patients because of the cost and insurance coverage. What's your experience with that? Same. I, I've uh, I've gone through the training process. I haven't actually done it yet. The cost, uh, Richard mentioned the cost in the UK. Here in the US, it's uh, seventy seven hundred dollars, seven thousand seven hundred dollars, which has uh, and and that is only for the device. It, since it's not been covered by insurance, the patient's also responsible for the surgeon fee and the uh, anesthesia fee, facility fee. So the cost can get close to ten thousand or more out of pocket. So it really has limited the number of patients that can that uh, can be you uh, can be used for. But that ad, the coverage is actually getting better. So I expect that'll pick up in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, that's uh, that, yeah, that's my experience as well. I'm sorry, do you have a? Bit of a Connection issue. Um, I'm logging off for another computer, sorry, because of a connection issue. Can I go through my computer? Hello. I think uh, there is a technical issue getting sorted shortly, hopefully. <laughs> while, uh, while he's logging on from another computer, I'll go ahead and, uh, and show, um, we'll go ahead and show the iris, uh, another iris sutured IOL video. Um, let's see, can we, uh, can we see this? Can everyone see this video? Not yet. Okay. No. Or do I need to stop? I'll maybe stop my screen. Hold on. Showing the screen. So I've stopped my screen there. All right, let's try that again. Right. Okay, can you see the video now? No, yeah. No, back yeah okay. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, yeah there you are. Okay, very good. Uh, Abdullah, can you upload from your side? Just. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah issue here so our um next part is uh I, is a man speaking to us about iris prolapse mm. <laughs> yes yeah, so would you like me to share my screen yeah please, please. yes if you that. can share your uh, powerpoint please So, uh, yeah. Is it coming now? There we are. If you can go to uh, amends bits. Okay. Um, get to the screen. Richard and Grant's going to be challenging. I mean, they were demonstrating some incredible dexterity in the eye. Um, I'm going to be talking about now RS products, which is much more mundane, but probably more common um, than, than repairing um, RS uh, defects. But, um, Irish prolapse happens a lot, and, uh, and I have a fair, a pretty healthy experience with it, unfortunately, I think. Um, and it's all due to the sort of Bernoulli. Can, can you repeat that in different block hours? Give you slightly larger pupil. Yeah. Uh, going on, I believe. Yeah. So, uh, can we see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, as Dr. Salam... Oh, are we good? Are we good, but Abdallah? Sorry, yeah, can you see me? Can you see her? Yeah, can you make it share screen? Yeah, can you see her? Can you do the screen and show her, that's it. Is it showing now? Yeah, that's good, yeah. So the um, the pressure in the eye is, um, is inversely related to the speed of the fluid going through it. So if you get a high speed fluid going out of the eye, you get a rapid d d um, reduction in pressure. As you open the eye the wound, the corneal wound to the eye, fluid rocks up more rapidly. That, would, that, that results in a very high vacuum. So th there's a big pressure drop because the, uh, from that top, top power point, that, that top bullet point there, the pressure is inversely related to the speed. As the fluid rocks up, there's a huge drop in the pressure in the anterior segment. You then get a pressure gradient 
with more pressure in the pressure segment than the anterior segment. And that's usually fine. That manages fine until there's a critical point which when the iris prolapses. And that critical point is, is, is varied on, uh, depends on a variety of things. The wound construction grants already alluded that earlier on, probably the location of the grant uh, the, the, um, of the wound rather than the grant. Um, of the wound, probably more important. The iris configuration, if it's very anterior iris, and, and the tonicity of the iris, which is affected by um, the drug, um, the alpha blockers. So here we've got some diagrams which I've taken from this paper from JSRS almost eight years ago now, where in A, on the top left, you've got a closed wound. In B, that wound is open, and you can see that blue line represents fluid escaping from the anterior segment out of the eye. And as that, that fluid flows out rapidly, there's a reduction, a huge reduction in the pressure in the anterior segment. And that leads to this configuration in C, where the iris is then tented up towards that wound, and eventually the absolute prolapses. So that sort of summarizes, I think, I hope, rather simply the Bernoulli principle. Where, and when the iris prolapses, there's a, there's a very, it's very tempting to try and stick some viscoelastic out through the prolapsing wound to try and um, push the iris back. And this is what not to do. And actually, as you inject more viscoelastic into the anterior segment, you get a great rush of viscoelastic back out of that wound which leads to further prolapsing. So here we have the iris prolapsing. If you don't try to the iris back in with this elastic, it just pulls back straight out that wound and the iris continues to prolapse more and certainly doesn't go back in, no matter what you do. What you want to do is, is, is try and reduce that differential. So try and burp the proximal segment. Try and remove the OVDs from the easier side port and then press on the, the iris to try and burp the proximal segment. Now here we have a case where there's um, again, uh, some capsule vial being injected under air, and you'll see a distortion in the pupil momentarily just there, which suggests that there's a, an increase in prostate segment pressure, and eventually that prostate segment pressure is much greater than the anterior segment pressure, and there's a critical problem that happens when the iris prolapses, and you can see there's a bit of finger pressing on the eye because there's an anxiety of the pressure. Now what you want to do is release the pressure posteriorly. You can either go in underneath the iris, which is difficult to do if they're focused, or just press on the top of the iris to try and burp that posterior segment fluid to try and cause some um, equilibrium between the, between the posterior and the anterior segment. That's what you want to do. And release the elastic from preferably a side port and go in and burp um, the <coughs> um, by pressing on the iris anteriorly. If they're already too difficult, then you might be more comfortable to go and perhaps lift the iris. Um, yeah. Can I just ask a question? When you yeah. say, when you say the posterior segment, you burp the posterior segment. Do you mean you're both you're bursting, you're burping the posterior chamber? Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Yes, yeah, yeah. Not the posterior segment. No, I'm, I'm not going into, I'm, I'm burping, into the vitreous cavity. Yeah, the vitreous cavity. I'm just pressing on the iris to try and burp the fluid or the, the pressure. BSS. Right. That's probably you know, um, migrated posteriorly, burping that into the anterior segment. So I'm not going into the posterior segment, I'm burping um, on top of the iris. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and, and, and honestly, I think, you know, iris prolapse happens so often. And if you can uh, maneuver, make maneuvers early on, because once the iris gets involved with any wound, it loves it. It's like a momentum. It just goes to the, the area that, that, that it wants to go to. It becomes more atrophied, and it, and it's a real move to get back in. Do you guys then have any other maneuvers or thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, actually, as, as I just showed, you can insert a block of viscoelastic, but this needs to be covered with slightly increasing the incision size, so this just will change the pressure differential. Yeah. The other option is to do a single uh, iris hook, not necessarily as the main incision, but just nearby from the main incision that will stick the iris, one or maybe occasionally two. But uh, the most important is not to ignore the problem, otherwise you will end with significant iris damage and it can make it worse. Putting the viscal up will be easier from another site. So if you can't go at the wound site where the iris has already got involved, it's very difficult to get that, that stuff in. Whereas if you go from another site, it might be a bit easier. Right. Um, can you move to the next slide, uh, Abdullah? 
yeah. Man, do you want to show the supracroidal hemorrhage here? That uh, we'll do that toward the end, perhaps we'll be after the artificial. After the, uh, I think if you can show it here would be better. Just the way uh, the slides are structured. Sorry. I mean, uh, one of the issues, you know, one of the major things to consider if the RS is prolapsing is if that pressure in the posterior segment is markedly raised because of, of course, the supracoidal hemorrhage. Now, Rich has already alluded to the RS clip lenses. Um, I tend to prefer putting RS clip lenses posteriorly as well. And I'll show you why. I mean, to put them in anteriorly, you, you need to use um, uh, some vacuum to enclave the iris into the IOL. So here we have an IOL being put into the um into the anterior segment and there's the enclavation you can see a dark area just uh, inferiorly there and that's a supercoidal developing over just about half a minute cornea becomes cloudy and that hemorrhage gets larger and then um and as that main wound is held in place everything's okay but once that main wound is opened that differential in pressure becomes much greater and the iris um prolapses out of the wind You've got to consider it, particularly if the iris prolapses aggressively and, and uh, um, that there is an explosive supercoil hemorrhage. Of course, here the supercoil hemorrhage is what was not noticed until quite late. It's a cautionary tale when using vacuum to try and enclave um, these iris clip lenses um, onto the iris. And what happened to this case, man? <laughs> it, it didn't end well for anyone. Yeah, it just, uh, I think the message here, as Amano was saying, try to really finish off very quickly and close, 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 especially with a big wound. Unfortunately, it's not as controlled as Keiko. Well, the challenge is in anterior segment surgery. It's noted much late, uh, very late. Yes. Uh, and yeah. noted that hemorrhage is usually quite, uh, quite expulsive already. And for trainees watching us, the first uh, instrument to look for is your thumb to close the wound. And then suture, suture with a bigger suture. If you can do an ATO quick suture, just try to close the eye quickly. And if the iris is still sticking out, it, 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 it's not as critical. Just get the suture on and 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 try and close the eye. Yeah. Uh, Abdullah, can you, uh, for the sake of time, can we move to the lens iris retro uh, pulsion back then? If you can move to your uh, video, please. Yeah. So this happens in vitrectomized eyes and in very high myopic, and it can be a problem. So Abdullah is going to show us how he deals with this. Abdullah? It's actually a very common occurrence uh, in vitrectomized eyes. And I'll show you uh, the pupil it becomes floppy and the AC becomes deep. And the only way to solve that uh, is that either to lift the iris or occasionally you can depress the anterior capsular rim. Um, this is a mild case, but when you have a vitrectomy, you may end up with a severe case. As you can see here, significant retrobulsion. The AC becomes very deep, and that makes even removal of the cortex is very difficult. Also, earlier on in the surgery, nuclear assembly is difficult, and you can see all the stuff becomes difficult. And once you try to push the iris to decrease the bubillary size, it comes back again. Even if we try to drop down the infusion, it recurs and recurs. So, Abdullah, the tip is to lift the iris up or push the capsule down, right? Yes. And the uh, tip I do, if the nucleus is soft, in, sometimes it's easier it's to prolapse it in the uh, AC and do a little bit at the, at the iris plane, nuclear disassembly at the iris brain. And I, think, I think it's worth um, informing patients who are vitrectomized and high myops that it may be quite uncomfortable. This is, you know, yeah. this is uncomfortable and if it doesn't happen, that's fine. But if it does happen, you want to warn them that it might be quite uncomfortable. Yeah. And the other thing actually you can do, this is one of the indication, you can put just a single hook, preferably at six o'clock or even at any other side. It may help to support the iris lens diaphragm and stop further uh, retrobulging. Right. Uh, Grant, uh, can we, uh, can, can you show us your video maybe quickly if you can? Uh, we're running out of time. Of the iris lens. <coughs> can you see it? Uh, no, uh, let me, yes, we can see it now.
Thank you. Okay. Um, this is a, so the important features for iris suture lens quickly, um, you can do it as a primary technique or secondary technique. In this case, this was a dislocated uh, lens implant. Um, you really, <clears throat> it has to be either a three piece uh, foldable lens or a single piece PMMA, but you, you definitely don't want to do this with acrylic lenses. Um, and the indications for this are when there are uh, when is there inadequate support with both anterior and posterior capsule? Of course, if you have a posterior capsule tear, but an intact capsularexis, you can just do a sulcus lens. But for instance, if you had a radialized uh, anterior capsule tear that went around to the posterior capsule, that provides an avenue for a sulcus fixated lens to dislocate. So you're really adding iris sutures is really beneficial here. Um, the only caveat, you know, you, you, you can uh, definitely get... Um, both pupillary blocks, so you may want to do a PI in some cases, but you can also get uh, iris chafing. So I would not do this in, in cases with uh, pre-existing pigment dispersion or iris defects or in patients with glaucoma. Also, high myopes and or uh, previously vitrectomized eyes because there's a lot of bouncing around of, uh, of the lens diaphragm in those cases. So I, I would avoid it there. Um, so starting this case, uh, there is some vitreous here. I'm just inspecting um, to make sure that they, that it's the uh, three-piece lens and that the haptics are in good shape. I didn't show it, but I rotated it around so that the haptics are where I want them to be. The optic is prolapsed anterior to the iris. And then you want to constrict the pupil um, with myostat to keep that optic from falling back. Um, and at this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and perform just a limited uh, um, anterior vitrectomy through limbal incisions. Um, to uh, pull the vitreous, you know, back posteriorly here, um, and then put a viscoelastic in the anterior chamber. Similar to the previous uh, case, you want to make your incision aligned with the direction that you're going to make your um, suture passes. And so I made one incision there. The haptic is right there. I'm going to throw this, the suture this way. So I'm going to make my incision not radial, but aimed toward the haptic. This is a tenoproline on a curved needle. I find it helpful to have a second instrument behind the optic to lift up or uh, lift interior, which helps you outline where the haptic is. Um, so I want to go as peripheral as possible with this throw um, on the haptic. And, and then I'll use a little bit of counter traction with the viscoelastic cannula to assist the tip of the needle coming out through the um, other end of the iris. And then I just put uh, stab that just straight through the peripheral cornea with this needle. Um, which you can also do with your seeps or knots on iris defects. I mean, you don't have to have that distal throw uh, accessible anymore. And I just leave that there because it actually suspends the, the implant and uh, allows it to be stabilized while you throw the second throw. Um, and again, this one's just coming straight out through the cornea. I don't have another incision made there. And as I uh, pull that through, I don't need to show this because we just tie both of those throws with the seeps or not. And you guys have seen some videos of that before. Um, so both of those are uh, tied with, with uh, seeps or not, and then trimmed. Uh, important things here, peripheral as possible with the suture bites. Um, and you want it to be pretty much 180 degrees apart to allow for proper lens centration. And then once I'm confident that I've got the haptics secured, you just dunk the iris, dunk the optic back posterior to the iris. Have a little bit of peaking here on this uh, suture. So you can take your microforceps and actually that's usually because you've incarcerated a little bit too much iris stroma with the suture throw. You can just pull on it a little bit and that'll relieve any iris stroma incarceration and it'll uh, make the pupil nice and round again. <coughs> That's very beautiful, Grant. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Abdallah, can you show us your technique for artisan uh, quickly, if you can go straight to the technique as we do that? Uh, any comments from uh, Richards and the man about iris fixation? I don't do it myself. No. I, I get the lens tilt, so I stop doing it. The screen? Yeah. Can you see my screen? Those forceps again that you use to... to, to, to Unstretch the people. Were there the MS, the, the armored MS, FM MS people? Right. I'm glad you're on. If you can go straight to the video, please. And yeah. Thank you. Uh, occasionally, uh, I do a lot of sclera fixation nowadays, but occasionally I do uh, iris supported lenses, the artisan lens. They are actually uh, very useful, and the technique actually is very simple. In all my cases, I prefer to do uh, iridectomy or iridotomy if I'm combining it with any other surgery. 
I quickly go through the video. Uh, I'll just try to flip the lens because I'm planning to put it retro -bubillary. So I flip it upside down. I make about six millimeter incision because these lenses are hard. So they are not foldable. And once I put it in the AC, I rotate it to the orientation where I want to put it. And then I try to use this mark as a guide. I hold it nicely where, with any uh, forceps. And here we don't use any vacuum. I just use uh, any cannula just to enclave the first iris. And then I swab my hands. And this is an important step, actually. You need to swipe as the iris a little bit so the, to minimize any trauma while tr you're trying to enclave the second haptic. And then swap the hands, put the second haptic under the uh, iris, and then enclave it. Again, with the lacrimal cannula. Some surgeons put the lens wholly under the iris and they try to enclave it, but that's really uh, technically challenging. I found that swabbing the hands is very easy to do. And then you put uh, usually two or three sutures will uh, enough to secure the uh, six millimeter wound. Right. I'll show you an, another case. It's very similar to the technique. I will go quickly through it. Again, put the lens and fill, uh, flip it upside down and rotate it to three and, uh, and nine clock meridian. And once you rotate it, here initially I used an anterior chamber maintainer, but once, once I secured the lens in place, I took the uh, ACM out. And I injected slightly my cold to constrict the pupil. And now the pupil is nicely constricted. Again, this mark usually helps with the orientation. And with the lens holding the forceps, I hold it from the center as much as I can, push one side under the uh, iris, again, without any vacuum, just with a lacrimal cannula or a viscoelastic cannula, I engage and I make sure that I, good, I, I get a good grip of the iris. Then swap hands with any uh, cannula. I just try to swipe the iris a little bit. This step is really useful to make it easy to push the second haptic under the uh, iris. Well, that's a great tip. So we have a question here about iridotomy. So uh, I, I, I wouldn't do iridotomies. I mean, I don't do artisan. I don't do artisan now because it's not available in the US, but uh, I did not used to do iridotomy before. Richard, do you do iridotomies or? Yeah, I always, I do that technique uh, that Abdul has just shown really nicely there. And I always do a PI. For, and you do it under the iris as well. And a man, do you um, do iridotomy? I, do iridotomy? I tend to do the technique that Abdullah said was, was too was, was, was awkward. I tend to put it all in behind the eye and then clip and then swap hands and clip. Uh, because I worry, that, I mean, when you've clipped one side and then you try and maneuver it under the optic, uh, under the pupil, I, I worried that you would disenclave the bit that you've just you just enclave, but you know. So. And do you do iridectomy as well, or because the vault is away from the iris, you don't do iridectomy? I don't. I mean, if, there's always a question. And in a vitrectomized eye, do you need to put it iridotomy anyway? I do, um, but that's probably out of habit um, yeah. and, and out of anxiety. <laughs> yes, no, I think that's a good point. I, I usually see uh, most of my patients like two or three weeks after the surgery, so I want to sleep well over these days. And again, uh, clock can happen even if the lens is vaulted to the other side. Right, that's a good point. Block can happen, but you can also get, similarly, you can also get retropulsion with iris fixated lenses. Um, you can get reverse pupillary block, and so aridotomy would be helpful to, to uh, prevent that as well. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, the point yes, uh, I shown I made the uh, uh, iridectomy, but actually in this second case, this patient already had silicone oil before, so he already had like uh, an iridectomy at uh, six o'clock inferior one when the silicone oil was removed. <coughs> right. I liked I really liked Abdullah's um, technique there of swapping hands because what I tend to do is. I, I, like Amon says, I put the whole thing in behind the iris and then I, I lift the lens up so it, you have the imprint of it there so that you can then see where you've got to push down to enclavate. But 
I, I get myself in a bit of a pickle sometimes because it's quite difficult to get the cannula in exactly the right place for the enclavation and then doing it on the other side. Um, I end up trying to do it through the main wound with a, uh, a viscoelastic cannula that I've bent to 90 degrees. So I put it in and then do it on one side and then on the other. But it's not very, it always looks horrendous when I'm doing it. And then when they're in place, they look lovely. But uh, it's really fiddly. And you made that look really, really nice there, Abdullah. So I think I'm going to do that technique from now on. Using a straight proline needle going across. So placing that right across the, the, the cornea, and then that acts as a as a plane, and then you can lift the IOL onto the onto the enclavation uh, and use the proline needle as a um, as a enclave the, 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 the IOL onto the iris. So you're using the needle. You're actually holding the needle, or do you put it through? Yeah, through you put something. the needle through the cornea from one side to the other. Now that is 180 degrees. You know that's going to be, you know, that yeah. they're going. to degrees apart and then you use that needle as an enclavation tool to lift up the IOL onto and then you can press press down onto it that sounds like quite and, and so the needle goes through your paracentesis does it or through just through the stroma well you create a paracentesis if you wish um, opposite each other and the needle goes right across the the eye mm. and, that, and, and that is, does it go out the other end do you yeah. have it coming out through the through the through the cornea at the other end sitting there it's basically kebabbing the whole anterior chamber. Yeah. Right. But then using that as a as a as a tool to lift the IOL onto, so that because uh, it will be in the right position as long as one haptic's correct, you know the other haptic's going to be along the along the needle because it's a straight needle. Mm. Uh, Abdullah, we have a question here from uh, Dr. Muhammad Tawfiq. Do you have experience on toric aphakic artisan? <laughs> no, we we don't usually use the toric option because. Yeah. Uh, in these cases, already had many complications. <laughs> I think there is not a concern for uh, retina surgeons. Yes. Yes. And uh, another thing, actually, uh, with these lenses, uh, these are BMMA lenses. So you make a, like a six millimeter incision. So occasionally, with this large incision, uh, the astigmatism outcome is a little bit unpredictable compared to like if. But I'm aware that there are some uh, injectable uh, coming in the future. I get. Interesting. Mm. Right. Well, thank you so much. Any final comments from the panel as we conclude our uh, talk? No? Oh, sorry. All right. Well, uh, uh, so maybe in a quick, uh, quick question to each uh, Abdallah. So, what's your um, in, in a quick uh, comment? What's your preferred uh, uh, correction of apica? Is it artisan or is it uh, square fixation? No, I, I usually do scleral fixation, the garbo Chariot method, where you do uh, a scleral tunnel and you inject a good one of the haptic through the tunnel. Right. It's, uh, very similar to the Amani. Actually, it came before the Amani technique, like yes. three years earlier. But I like it for, for a couple of reasons. One, it's easier. Second, uh, you get a good scleral uh, track for the haptic. So I think that the risk of disintegration or tilt is much lower than the Amani. But actually, I also like the uh, retrovirbillary artisan. I have done many of these cases, and I have followed them up over uh, five years now. They are doing really well. Initially, I had a concern that I, uh, with, over time, iris atrophy or problems with the iris uh, may occur, and they may disengage or fall to the back of the eye. But actually, I've never seen that. And I wonder if any one of the panel experienced problems with the retrovirbillary artisan being disengaged after five years or ten years. Or... No, I've I've been using them for years and years, retro pupillary like that, and you know they work really really well. Um, uh, the the only concern that I've got with them is you know if you've got a uveitic or somebody who, you, you know, if you've got somebody who's got macular edema and that kind of thing, you might not want to use it for those. I've not yeah. seen them as well dropping, but one concern is Marfan patient. We did one on the Marfan because the whole iris keeps yeah. uh, moving. You got a very bad CME, which interestingly resolved with um, an anti-chamber IOL and uh, steroid injection. He did well. 
so uh, Richard, in a quick comment, what's your preferred method for correction of aphakia? Is it uh, um, well, it's it, it well. It used. To, I, I got really keen on doing Yamanis, and um, you know the the thing is they they're quite fiddly things to do, and it's quite easy to just slightly kink the haptic, and then you've got a, a misplaced IOL or you know comma type optical problems. Um, so I'm now really keen on the this Carlevali lens that I showed. Um, uh -huh. You know, it's specifically designed to be in that position, and it's actually quite easy to put in. Nice. And then what do you do? Like, I mean, that's too complicated a question. I, I think uh, any any indication that's got 10, 15 options it, it illustrates that each option has its own flaws. And what do you <coughs> do? Well, I used to do a lot of score, fix, uh, score fixation. I, I got very frustrated with them, which I felt there is some tilt. Uh, I think uh, the RS clip lenses are, 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 are a good option. And I've started using off-label use of Acrios lenses, which are four points. They've got four haptics, and, and they... You get much less tilt, I think, and, and, they, and they suit you nicely to the, to the, to the sclera. Nice. And uh, Grant, we don't have Artisan here in the U.S. What do you do? Yeah, so <clears throat> in the U.S., you know, we really only get new lens implants approved every uh, 15 or 20 years. Um, so we just uh, have to go with what we have. Um, I, I uh, have very few patients I feel like are good candidates for iris fixated lenses in a glaucoma practice anyway. Um, same for ACIOLs. Um, so spiral fixation is still uh, my favorite, um, and, and, and I'm going more and more towards Yamani, but as Richard said, you know, you really have to have, I mean, everything has to be perfect. You have to have the right lens implant. You can't do it with a lot of uh, lens implants. You have to, you know, have the proper lens implant um, <clears throat> with the proper haptics and, and the right needles to fit it in. So it's a very finicky technique. Otherwise, um, as Abdallah, uh, Abdallah said, I'm a fan of... Uh, the uh, the Gabor Sharyov tunnels uh, and under scleral flaps, which are uh, just a little bit technically easier. You could also use it as a rescue technique for a lot of lenses. Nice. I do an two chamber IOL, but if there are issues with cornea or iris or angle, I would use a four point uh, acrius IOL, like was a man saying, and I put it about four millimeter behind the um, the limbus, so I have clearance from the iris because it's a one-piece lens and that works so well and we're making the conjunctival opening even smaller now to try to avoid irritation well thank you so much all we really appreciate uh, your time and uh, thank for our audience as well and please continue to send us questions we can try to answer them as much as uh, we can uh, on the facebook and on the youtube uh, particularly the facebook and thanks so much for our panels, Dr. Abdullah Ben from the UK, Dr. Haynes from uh, Bristol, UK, and Dr. Aman Chandra uh, from uh, Thousand, UK, and uh, Dr. Morshedi, who's uh, my compatriot here from uh, Arkansas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.